Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much uh, for making time to join us today. This is Perspectives, a Portland initiative by Kiwani. Before we get started, uh, I'll ask you one question to check if you can see and hear as well. So you will get a poll. Uh, please respond so that we know uh, there are no technology issues before we get started. So today's webinar is about uh, biosafety and biocontainment. And this is presented by Viresh. A brief introduction about Viresh. Viresh is a highly skilled leader with 25 years of experience in delivering complex end-to-end -end projects. Viresh expertise spans across design, engineering, planning and control, procurement, investment planning, quality and regulatory compliance, US FDA and EU GMP, top biopharmaceuticals and pharmaceutical majors across India and abroad. After having worked with Biocon for more than 20 years, uh, currently Viresh serves as the director and CEO of Triata Life Tech Private Limited, an end to end engineering consultancy and process consultancy services provider. Well, before I hand over the reins to Viresh, just a little housekeeping. Please stay on mute. Um, wait for the QA session to ask a question. But if during the session you have any questions that come to your mind, you can always use the Q&A option that's available on the Zoom control panel to drop in your questions. So we'll pick them up and then answer during the dedicated Q&A session. In the event we cannot answer all questions, don't uh, worry about it. Uh, we will take these questions offline and post the responses on our website, which is uh, kiwani.in. And we'll also share a recording of this webinar, a copy of the presentation and the Q&A on our website. So now without further ado, Let's turn the time over to Viresh. Viresh, all yours. Thank you, Vijay, for that introduction. Um, <clears throat> good afternoon or good morning to all the participants to this webinar. And I hope you and your family are uh, fine and uh, well in this surreal times. COVID-19 has been a teacher to us. It's a bio disaster which we have faced. Probably we have faced more than one bio disasters in our generation. Uh, be it Ebola, COVID-19, H1N1, swine flu. And we thought that what better topic should we pick up than to talk about biosafety and biocontainment. So in today's discussion, we are going to take uh, you through the concepts of biosafety and biocontainment, and then touch on the essentials of a facility design, which is compliant to biosafety requirements, uh, talk a little bit about the biosafety cabinet selection, and then uh, wrap up the session with the Q&A, uh, apart from the key takeaways that we will do. Before we get into the discussions on biosafety and biocontainment, I would like all of you to watch a short video, which is a video produced by USA Today uh, as a part of an investigation done by the Center for Disease Control. It's a three minute video and I would uh, request everyone to pay attention to some of the discussions which are on this video, which would be uh, discussed as we move along. Scientists experiment with them in bio labs strewn across the US to discover new ways to treat and prevent diseases. But how safe are the experiments? And what happens if something goes wrong in these kinds of labs? We don't even know how many high containment labs there are in the United States. Following lab mistakes at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention that potentially expose workers to anthrax, Ebola, and a deadly strain of bird flu, a USA Today network investigation found hundreds of accidents have happened at labs nationwide with little or no public disclosure. What the CDC incidents showed us this summer in particular is that the very best labs are not perfectly safe. Like in Louisiana, where tests are currently underway to make sure a deadly bioterror bacterium hasn't contaminated the soil and water around the Tulane National Primate Research Center near New Orleans. Federal officials say sloppy biosafety practices led to the infection of monkeys that had been living in an outdoor breeding colony. We clearly screwed up, there's no doubt, and I'm very sorry about that. So far, no tests have detected the bacterium outdoors, but it's the overall secrecy with which these accidents and investigations are handled that caused the most concern. The irony is that the more 
people in the community feel that there's secrecy, the more they're distrustful, whether it's even warranted, their distrust is warranted or not. Our investigation identified more than 200 labs operating at a biosafety level three and four, the highest levels of containment. Lab safety experts say the best labs put safety first and emphasize that serious infections among lab workers are rare. Rarer still, incidents where labs become the source of an outbreak. Almost all accidents occur um, with things that are, with pathogens that are not, um, that aren't transmissible. So the Ebola vaccine that we are starting to come up with, and we have several different candidates, you know, these would not be possible to develop if we did not have high containment laboratories. And while the benefits may be clear, what's actually going on inside the labs is not. It's impossible to get a full picture of lab incidents and accidents because oversight is fragmented, often secretive, and largely self-policing. We found that more than 100 labs experimenting with potential bioterror agents have faced enforcement actions for serious safety violations since 2003. Some are repeat offenders. Five labs have faced sanctions multiple times. Two were kicked out of the select agent program, five others suspended. Who and where are they? Federal regulators won't release their names. They say a 2002 bioterrorism law requires this information be kept secret. Some say that's not enough. It's crucial for, for journalists and, and safety advocates and others to keep digging and trying to find out what's going on. So now let's dive into the some definitions or basics on biosafety and biocontainment. So first and foremost, let us identify what a biohazard is. A biohazard is any microorganism or a biological agent which has a potential of causing a disease to a human being, animal, or a plant. And generally, it does not just restrict itself to the biological agent or the organism, but is applicable also to any toxins or allergens that get produced by these organisms. Biocontainment, on the other hand, is a means or a measure of confining the biohazard from accidental release into the surrounding and thus causing a potential to infect a person, plant or animal or the environment at large. What is biosafety? Biosafety is a scale that is used to measure uh, how to handle a biohazard. And we will talk more about biosafety as we go along. Biodisaster, do I even need to define this? We are all facing a biodisaster today, COVID-19, uh, Ebola, H1N1, swine flu, we've seen it all in our generations. And so bio disaster leads to outbreak of diseases at a pandemic level, causing fatalities, causing economical disruptions, and at times causing environmental damages. We cannot stop having biosafety labs. That's very important because these are required for conducting research for making the life of people better, right? So let's now dive into what biosafety is. What are the fundamental objectives of biosafety? The obvious fundamental objective of biosafety is to ensure that there is a containment of the biological agent from its accidental release or exposure to the workers. Biosafety also covers the safe methods the infrastructure of a facility, the equipment that is used, which goes into these kind of research or in manufacturing facilities. And then of course, it talks about the measure which needs to reduce or eliminate the risk of exposure to the laboratory workers who are working with these biohazards. The first step in biosafety is risk assessment. What is risk assessment? Risk assessment is a procedure or a systematic protocol which is followed to assess what is the biohazard we are dealing with, what is the potential of its harm, and how do we ensure that we take measures so that there is no impact it creates through accidental release or exposure to the workers working with it, to the environment or the surroundings around that facility, right? 
So let's now move on to understand what is, uh, how does biosafety gets classified or how do we get exposed to these hazardous uh, organisms. The first route of exposure is inhalation, that is through the respiratory route. The second one is to droplets and COVID-19 has taught us a lot more on how droplets can cause infection. All of us have become conscious about it. Ingestion, outbreaks like cholera have been a part of how ingestion can cause a outbreak of a biohazard. Inoculation, usage of contaminated needles, contaminated uh, medicines through the intravenous route is the other route of exposure and then indirect contact, where it is either to contact through animals, to uh, surfaces, etc. These are the routes of exposure. When we talk about biosafety, we need to consider three factors which are multiplying with each other. The hazard itself, the level at which that hazard is there, the route of exposure, and the vulnerability of a person, animal, or a plant, or the environment to that hazard. And therefore, the effect just multiplies. It is not an additive effect. It is not a, a either or effect. It's a multiplying factor. So in identifying any biosafety, the first thing is to do a hazard identification, to characterize the uh, hazard, then to do an exposure assessment to find out what are the routes by which a person can get exposed to that hazard, and then, of course, to characterize the risk. The CDC, which is the Center for Disease Control, United States of America, has come up with four levels of biosafety. And this is a scale, as I was speaking a little bit earlier, to measure the level at which you are dealing with a biohazard. There are four primary levels, level one, two, three, and four. And as you can see, it goes from a low-risk microbe to a high-risk microbe. So let's just understand what BSL-1 is all about. BSL-1 are uh, a scale which is given to an organism which is generally regarded as safe and not known to cause a disease to a healthy human and uh, to the environment around. These are uh, organisms, organisms like canine hepatitis or uh, Escherichia coli, which are non pathogenic in nature, and the organisms which we have to deal with day on day. On. When we talk about BSL-2, these have moderate or potential uh, hazard to a person and the environment. It could have bacteria as well as viruses and can cause mild diseases. But BSL-2 organisms are those where there is a potential cure, which is available. Examples here are hepatitis A, B, C, influenza A. These are all BSL-2 organisms. When we talk about BSL-3, they could be either uh, indigenous or exotic microbes, and they can seriously cause a lethal disease, disease with the primary route of exposure being respiratory. Uh, we've seen H1N1 flu, tuberculosis, SARS. These are examples which have been classified as BSL-3. And BSL-4 are dangerous and exotic, which pose a high risk of transmission through aerosol and create a cause fatality. And there are no known treatments or vaccines. Even for BSL-3, there is not a necessary route of treatment or vaccination in some cases like we have in SARS. But uh, since the characterization is known and the respiratory route of transmission can be controlled, it gets classified as BSL-3. So as you can see, the microorganisms or the biohazards get classified into these four levels. Whereas coronavirus is a question I get asked a lot of times. I do not have an answer to that because the scientists have not yet been able to classify it. And in my own uh, wisdom, if I don't know about a hazard, I would straight away put it in BSL-4 or at the most, uh, bring it down to BSL-3. I would never put it in BSL-2 or BSL-1. Now let's move on to understand that, okay, we have now understood what biosafety levels are, what a biohazard is, 
how do we contain so containment is a means or a, any science that we apply to make sure that we are able to confine the microorganism from exposure uh, to people and to the environment and therefore causing a risk of a disease there are two primary containment methodologies the first one is biological containment and the second one is physical containment when we talk about biological containment in simple terms it's a microbiological activity which is used to make the microorganism ineffective in terms of its uh, potential to cause a harm to a human being plant or animal in in more uh, direct terms in terms of uh, definition what would be done is the combination of vector and host in a microorganism is modified in such a way that the ineffectivity of the vector uh, to a specific host can be controlled apart from controlling the host and the vector uh, in a environment because we cannot work with a species unless we are having the live organism to work with and see what we are trying to research about we are not going to talk about biological containment and the rest of our topic today because that's a subject by itself and i am not an expert on it it would be more appropriate for a microbiologist to talk about it what we are going to cover in today's webinar is going to be the physical containment and as the word by itself says physical containment is any barrier that we create to confine the pathogenic organism or to control the pathogenic organism from it being accidentally exposed to the environment or the human beings around it physical containment is of two types uh, there are the primary barriers and the secondary barriers and what are the primary barriers the equipment which are used while handling the biohazard fall under primary barriers this would include biosafety cabinets it could include safety cups and a centrifuge or it could also include things like auto pipettes uh, the second primary barrier is the personal protective equipment which are the gloves the safety gloves the respiratory um, suit that people wear these fall as primary barriers the secondary barriers are the infrastructure in which these kind of researchers or handling of biohazard is conducted what would that include would include separation of the laboratory space from the rest of the areas or the general access areas introduction of air locks introduction of certain uh, equipment within that facility to allow the decontamination of the uh biohazard after the experiment is over and then of course the emergency means in terms of exit shower signage waste disposal bins uh etc etc and we will cover a little bit of this when we come to the facility uh, design aspect of it now let's look at uh, the recommended practices and barriers in biosafety level uh and i'm i have taken this table from the guidelines of the who and this is a summary of it when i am talking about these levels please understand that this is only a guidance and this is not a bible to say that this is the only thing which has to be done for any facility to decide what kind of primary barriers or secondary barriers need to be applied one needs to carry out a risk assessment which we'll talk about when we go to the facility design and make sure that we do a risk assessment and then apply the physical containment means so when we talk about bsl1 these are not uh, going to cause diseases because these are generally safe the standard practices which have to be followed are those uh, good microbiological practices uh there are no primary barriers required uh pp can be worn on a need basis and generally on a facility aspect also a regular laboratory bench and a sink could suffice the need when it comes to biosafety level 2 then there is a possibility of a moderate 
infection. And therefore, uh, we have to, apart from following good standard microbiological practices, limit the access to these work areas uh, from the general access which is available, have the biohazard warning signs, and of course, take care of uh, having a written down protocol and procedures with respect to uh, usages of shops. Because one of the roots of infection is when the shops are used, you could prick yourself or you could have a cut on your skin and get infected. And this is more for the workers. So these are the practices which need to be introduced. Insofar as the primary barriers are concerned, we need to use biosafety cabinets. Uh, we need to use equipment with safety systems like uh, centrifuge uh, safety cups and of course ensure that any manipulation which is being done, we do not have use systems like mouth pipetting and stuff like that. So these are the primary barriers. PPE remain there on a need basis based on the risk assessment. And when we come to the risk assessment and the hierarchy of control, I would like to bring in the difference of what kind of PPE should be used in uh, the facilities and how important is PPE as a control mechanism. Apart from uh, the BSL-1 facility that we have used, we are going to use the BSC cabinets. Uh, for a BSL-2 facility, it is ideal to have the autoclave within the premises. It is not necessary to have this within the lab, but it is good to have an autoclave nearby so that the contamination can be done. When it comes to BSL-3 facilities, then it is very much necessary that the access is totally, totally controlled. The decontamination of all the waste which gets generated in the workplace and within the laboratory or the work, uh, work area needs to be done and decontamination of laboratory clothing is a must have. So you cannot go in with uh, contaminated clothes. So there is normally a change even on the street garments before you go inside a lab and whatever garments or the protective clothing that is worn inside the lab needs to get decontaminated before it is reused after the laundry. Insofar as the primary barriers are concerned, Biosafety cabinets are a must have. Uh, no open manipulations are uh, permitted. And the PPE, in terms of having proper gloves, face and eye mask, uh, respiratory protection, if necessary, has to be introduced. In terms of secondary barriers, there has to be necessarily a physical separation of these such laboratories from the rest of the areas. There should be interlocking doors, which are there in the laboratories. The laboratory is at a negative pressure, which means that the air does not flow out of the laboratory into the surrounding areas, but the surrounding areas send air into it. Now, this is a little bit of a, a debatable topic from only one perspective, that the exit airlocks, the airlocks to which the people go out or the material go out, also need to be negative and sometimes they need to be more negative as compared to the laboratory. But this again is an output from a risk assessment. Uh, entry into the lab is only through airlocks and entry rooms and then there has to be a necessarily decontamination in terms of hands or whatever is used uh, while handling the biohazard. When it comes to BSL-4, uh, it is very much necessary that the clothing gets changed before entering. Now, this is a practice which we have introduced even in BSL-3 because we do not want contamination of the garments which people wear when they move out of the laboratory. So it is a standard practice even to do a clothing change in BSL-3. Uh, shower and exit is a must have and all material has to get decontaminated whether be it clothing, be it equipment, be it any waste material, everything needs to get decontaminated. Uh, from a primary barrier perspective, uh, BSC cabinets class three are preferred on a BSL lab four. Uh, sometimes BSL two cabinets can also be used, uh, but again, dependent on risk assessment. In so far as the secondary barriers are concerned, Ideally, BSL-4 facilities are a separate building. Uh, 
generally not an isolated zone but a separate building within the premises uh, there has to be a dedicated supply and exhaust system the hvac systems are completely disconnected from the rest of the facility and then of course there are many other practices which are done based on risk assessment when it comes to treating a bsl3 and a bsl4 facility it is always ideal to make sure that the bsl3 facility can uh, follows a lot of the secondary barriers that we insist for bsl4 uh, the reason being that we are dealing with exotic and dangerous microorganisms even at bsl3 levels at times and it is ideal not to uh, compromise on some of these secondary barrier systems what are these labs used for bsl1 are used for general teaching and research purposes bsl2 is used for primary health diagnostic services and research again when it comes to bsl3 and 4 we are dealing with uh, high end pathogenic substances and therefore special diagnostic service or research gets carried out in bsl3 uh and four kind of facilities so these are the physical barriers which are recommended and when i say these are recommended please i would like to underline here that it is not the only thing which has to be done any physical barrier which we create has to be based on a risk assessment so let's now look at the key aspects of design on a biosafety facility the first and the foremost thing on any biosafety facility whether we are building it for the first time or we are assessing the biosafety uh, level of a facility which is to be used for a new organism or when a new worker is entering a biosafety facility these are the aspects of risk assessment which one needs to look at as an owner as an investor as a worker it is important to look at the risk assessment which was carried out for a facility to make sure that the facility is safe for the worker and the environment around so the first thing that needs to be done is the risk assessment what is the microorganism that we are dealing with what is the organism in use what are the different organisms that we would be using in this facilities what are the operations that we are going to perform is it just going to be like in case of covid 19 we perform an RNA extraction. There are operations like pipetting, centrifugation, and then the DNA gets uh, made out of it, or the pseudo DNA gets done. The thermal cycling gets done, and then you have the result. So uh, when you are dealing with any microorganisms, we need to identify all the operations which are being performed in the facility. And then, of course, the most important thing: what are the routes of exposure? Is it inoculation? Is it inhalation? Is it uh ingestion or is it a combination of this because a lot of times uh like we've seen in case of covid 19 uh it's droplets and inhalation both potentially causing an effect apart from indirect contact so we need to understand the suspected route of infection and this needs to be systematically approached and written down properly once we have done this we need to understand what are the procedures which could lead to a hazard what are the what if situations by which i could potentially expose the organism to the environment or to the worker and what are the procedures that we are going to follow in the facility so that's the next step of the risk assessment based on these two aspects of hazard identification and the procedural identification we assign a biosafety level from one of those four levels that we talked about biosafety 1 2 3 and 4 keeping in mind the hazard into exposure into vulnerability uh, matrix in mind and then based on this decide what are the physical barriers that we need to introduce into the system so that we are making the workplace safe the most important aspect of risk assessment which is on the next level is to ensure that the people who are dealing with the hazard are sufficiently trained they should be proficient in handling the biohazard and the second thing 
is to check the integrity of all the safety equipment which are being used, whether it is the biosafety cabinet, whether it is the centrifuges, any closed equipment which we use in that area has to be integral, calibrated, and has to be in top performing condition. So the maintenance of these facilities or the equipment which are used becomes very, very important. Based on this risk assessment, which is done in-house, it is always good to get the review of the risk assessment done by an expert who is a subject matter expert or by the local regulatory body. With this, the risk assessment, now you can decide what are the barriers that you need to clean. I use a risk assessment matrix. Uh, it's a five by four matrix, which I use generally uh, when I carry out a risk assessment of a biosafety facility. Uh, it is not sacrosanct that this is the only matrix. You could use five by five, you could use four by four. Uh, what is important is that we need to identify the probability of an occurrence of a biohazard versus its severity and then decide what biosafety level we will end up with. So when we talk about uh, probability, if it's very frequent or likely that uh, exposure will happen and it is likely to be catastrophic or critical, then the risk is very, very high and gets classified generally into biosafety level three or four. When it comes to a moderate severity and occasional or ascendal probability, because you could accidentally spill a vial, you could accidentally have a prepared break, or you could have a safety cup break. Uh, these are occasional or seldom occurrences. Then uh, you could downgrade it and put it again, either at BSL three or two. If it's an unlikely event, but it's still catastrophic or critical from a severity perspective, a BSL two could do with it. When it where it is moderate or negligible but occasional occurrence, again, you could do with BSL-2. And if it's very unlikely, it is negligible, then BSL-1 is the choice of vehicle safety level. And this is the very important aspect. Without a risk assessment, please do not design a facility. Please do not go ahead and work in an area without studying the risk assessment, which was carried out in that facility or deal with a new organ. Okay. Now, when we go to the hierarchy of controls, um, <clears throat> here is the increasing effectiveness. As I said, the biological means of uh, preventing the microorganism from becoming dangerous is the ideal way of doing an uh, effective control. However, it is not always going to be possible. So we have to think about substitution at times, but substitution in case of microorganisms does not work again. So elimination and substitution is the best control that a person has. The second most effective is the engineering control. And this refers to the infrastructure that we build in a facility, how the HVAC gets designed, how the uh, drainage system is designed, what are the controls that we have put in terms of the pressurization zones, uh, the airlocks which are available. These are all engineering controls which help you and are the most effective second line of defense on a facility. The third one is what kind of procedural and workplace controls are we introducing? Are we ensuring that every uh, high end laboratory like a BSL three or four has strict access control, limited access? These are all the procedures. And PPE is the last line of defense uh, because PPE is only a protective uh, gear which a person is donating and is saving himself or herself from uh, exposure, but it's not very effective. If you don't have the engineering controls in the place, the best of your PPEs are not going to help you. So please remember the hierarchy of control. PPE actually sits at the bottom of the pyramid. Uh, this is a summary of what is required in a facility. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to spend a quick time only on two topics, which is the ventilation system and having bios, biological safety cabinets. In terms of ventilation and controls, a BSL facility, even if you didn't have uh, inward airflow or a control ventilation system, that is fine. A general air conditioned space would work for it. 
When it comes to BSL-2, it is desirable to have an inward airflow and a controlled ventilation system, though it's not mandatory. Whereas when we go to BSL-3 and 4, these become mandatory. You have to have an inward airflow. There has to be, a, which means it's a negative pressure control zone. There has to be a control on the ventilation system and the HIPAA filtered air exhaust is a must have, both in BSL-3 and 4. Uh, though there is a no in BSL-3, this is again based on risk assessment. In terms of biological safety cabinets, BSL-1 do not demand a need for a biosafety cabinet, though it's nice to have. Whereas in BSL-2, it is always desirable to have a biosafety cabinet. In BSL-3 and 4, it's a must have. Uh, I would like to cover a little bit on animal facilities. When we talk about animal facilities, which are dealing with primates, then it is very important to understand that the practices which are fol followed in an animal facility are one level higher than a standard laboratory dealing only with microorganisms where humans are working on. For a BSL-1 facility, there has to be a limited access, which was otherwise applied on a BSL-2 facility. A BSL, a BSL-2 facility should have uh, biosafety cabinets and decontamination of waste and cages before washing. And a BSL-3 facility should have absolute control access with uh, respiratory suits or full body suits which are applied. A BSL-4 uh, class 3 BAC cabinet is the only thing which is going to get ex accepted apart from the other control measures that we talked about for BSL-3 and BSL-4. So this is about animal facilities. Uh, these are some typical layouts on uh, BSL 1, 2, and 3. These are available in standard literature, so I'm not going to spend too much time, but this is a BSL 1 facility. Um, if we go to a BSL 2 facility, you can um, see that there is an autoclave which has come in on the facility, though it's outside the laboratories, and the, BS, the biosafety cabinets have got exhaust systems which are introduced into uh, the system, and then you have waste bins with the biohazard waste signs. A BSL-3 now gets airlocks, so for every entry and exit, you do it through an airlock. Ideally, in a uh, BSL-3 facility, the entry and the exits are separated out. The autoclave moves or the decontamination chamber moves inside the facility, and the people have to wear uh, full body suits. Uh, this is uh, what I showed you was a very simplistic diagram, but this is how a BSL-3 facility would look like. You can see that the workspaces are limited to these areas here and here, whereas you can see the number of airlocks and how the entry and exits are being controlled through multiple sets of doors and interlocking doors. A typical cross-section of a BSL facility, this is the work area. This is the supplier system for a BSL facility. This is the exhaust air system. So there is, that is at level three, segregated from supplier system. There is a decontamination tank at the bottom where all the waste which is getting generated gets decontaminated before it goes into the drainage. So this is a typical four level facility. So this is this section here, level two is what I'm showing you here, but above and below that, there are other levels which go to support a BSL-3 and a four facility. Uh, insofar as the utilities are concerned, uh, these are the basic requirements the WHO has given that there should be good quality water. The water which is used for drinking and uh, for the laboratory should be completely uh, segregated and they should not be the same source. And then of course, there should be protection of any backflow or contamination into the public water system. Uh, water from personnel, shower and toilet can be discharged into sanitary sewers without treatment in case of BSL-1 and 2 BSL-2 facilities and 3 facilities at time. When it comes to BSL-4, you need to decontaminate even the water coming out of showers and toilets. Uh, effluents should be collected in closed vessels and decontaminated before disposal. This is a basic requirement specified by WHO. And protection of personnel is a must-have everywhere. Uh, the PPE recommended at these levels are uh, classified here that it's generally a good practice to wear gloves and protective laboratory coats, even in a BSL facility, though it's not mandatory. 
uh, apart, and when we go to BSL-2, respiratory protection based on risk assessment gets added. When we go to level three, then we are going to wear a much higher level of protective laboratory clothing in terms of scrub suits or full body suits. And when it comes to BSL-4, they have to be positive pressure body suits all the way and respiratory protection all the way. Now let's talk a little bit about biosafety cabinets. Um, a lot of times people come to me and say, I'm using a laminar airflow. What, why do I need to use a BAC cabinet? A BAC cabinet and laminar flow are distinct in one basic uh, difference of how the airflow occurs. In the laminar flow, the airflow is moving towards the person. Remember, biosafety is meant for protecting the workers and the environment from contamination of a biohazard. So any positive flow towards the worker is a complete no -no. So a, a laminar airflow unit cannot be used when you are dealing with a biohazard. The only thing which is permitted is biosafety cabinets. Biosafety cabinets are classified into three distinct uh, uh, classification or types, class one, class two, and class three. And within class two, there is type A1, A2, B1, B2, and C1, which we will talk about as we go along to the next slide. And then of course, the class three, which is the highest level of protection. In so far as the class one is concerned, biosafety, it provides personnel and environmental protection, but the product is not protected. The product can get, or the sample which you're dealing with, can get potentially contaminated with the outside air. Um, it's more or less obsolete now to use class one. People do not use class one as a BAC cabinet because of this particular reason that it could potentially contaminate the sample as a result of which there could be variable results when we do repeat experiments. When it comes to class two, it's a partial barrier system, which is dependent on the movement of air from uh, uh, from inside the cabinet and there are again different classifications within that which will come to but it has the capability of protecting the person the environment and the product uh, when it comes to class three it's an absolute gas tight enclosure which is going to protect the people the product and the environment uh, and these are recommended to be used in a bsl three based on risk assessment and definitely in a BSL-4 facility. What I'm giving you here is a, a, a summary of what uh, the different biosafety cabinets mean and where they can be used and what does it mean. So the velocity is defined by the standards. Uh, the standards that we are talking about are NFP uh, 49 uh, or 40, is that 45. Uh, and then the EN standards and the inflow velocities are clearly defined. In case of class one, the air which is coming in is unfiltered. It is exhausted back into the uh, surrounding within the laboratory. It does not offer any protection to the uh, product as we said, and uh, can be, while it can be used in biosafety level one, two and three based on risk assessment, uh, it is generally uh, obsolete uh, nowadays. When it comes to uh, the class two, the differences is between uh, what is the percentage of air which is getting recycled and what is getting exhausted. So that's the primary difference. And the second difference is again, uh, whether uh, the outside uh, air is allowed into the plenum or not allowed into the plenum. But the primary difference is that uh, for class two, you are going to have an exhaust system which is going to take the air out. When it comes to type A1, uh, outside air is the control plenum is surrounded by the outside air and therefore the risk of contamination stays. 70% of the air gets recycled, 30% gets exhausted. Uh, again, uh, class two type A1 is not generally used nowadays in any of the facilities. What is more popular to use is class two, type A2, type B1, type B2, where you have 70% air recycled in place of A2, 30% in case of B1, and 0% in case of B2. And in all these cases, there's a negative plenum around. So if there was any breach or any contaminant, it gets pulled out. In case of A2, you could leave the exhaust air inside the room after proper filtration through HEPA filters. 
but in case of D1 and D2, it has to be exhausted outside the room. So there needs to be an external exhaust system, which is putting the air out of from these cabinets. In case of class three, it's a completely closed system. The chamber is negative with respect to the outside and 100% exhaust to HEPA filter and proper treatment. Uh, there sometimes could be double HEPA filters. There could be a HEPA filter followed by a scrubber when you are exhausting it out. And uh, type three is what is recommended for uh, biosafety level four, whereas uh, one, two, and three can use any of the other cabinets. Uh, so I think with this, we get onto the summary of our discussion today. We've covered what a biosafety is. It's a scale of one to four, depending on the biohazard we are dealing with uh, and depending on the potential of the organism to cause a disease. When we talk about containment, it's a measure, it could be biological or physical, which is used to contain the effect, the harmful effect of the microorganism by limiting its exposure or making it ineffective if it got exposed. And uh, with this, uh, I would like to bring in the two other key takeaways. So on the left hand side, you see the four biosafety levels. Remember, one is the low risk microbe, four is the high risk microbe. Hierarchy of controls, PPE is the last line of defense. The first thing is elimination. Having a proper infrastructure, proper facility, well designed with good drainage system, good HVAC system is a key to control a biohazard. And then, uh, of course, the procedural controls play a very important role followed by the PPE. Risk assessment. Remember, risk assessment is a key to any biosafety uh, facility. Without a risk assessment, any biosafety facility constructed or workplace entered into uh, causes a potential for a bio disaster. And it is uh, very, very important to prevent bio disasters. We have all faced a bio disaster today and we see how uh, helpless we as human beings become in front of a bio disaster. And this is not the first time. Our generation is seeing probably the third bio disaster right from 2003, where we saw swine flu to 2007, uh, where we saw H1N1 flu and now COVID-19 in 2020. And we don't know how many more we are facing, given the fact that there is a lot of secrecy around it. With this, I would like to thank all the participants for listening to me attentively. And now we can open the session for questions and answers. Well, thank you, Viresh. Uh, thank you for this enlightening session. Um, there are a couple of questions uh, that have come in and a few more offline. Right. Uh, as much as possible, we'll pick them. And uh, let me go to the first question, which is from Van Bayani. Um, what are the minimum requirements in establishing a microbiology laboratory? when it comes to the building itself. Could there be a separate room for everything? For example, aside from the isolation room, where you do your analysis, the incubation should be separated. So uh, when we talk about a microbiology laboratory, again, let us uh, understand what are the kind of microorganisms we are dealing with. So that's a generally regarded as safe uh, or a BSL-1 level of a microorganism then uh, we don't have to necessarily have segregation. Though from a good laboratory practice or a good manufacturing practice, if it's attached to a, 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 a manufacturing facility, it is good to isolate the areas where the microorganism is being worked upon in a biosafety lab from the incubation uh, areas. Because in incubation, when you open the plates to count the uh, colonies or to assess the uh, growth pattern of these uh, microorganisms, you can likely create the general environment in the uh, microbiology room to get uh, infected. And therefore, it is better to segregate this out only from a general uh, good laboratory practice. When it comes to BSL-2 and BSL-3, absolutely a segregation is a must have uh, from the material preparation areas to the decontamination areas to the incubation areas to the areas where 
you are dealing with a biological organism or manipulating an organism. All right, wonderful. So the next one is uh, from Ravi Ram. BSL one and two. What happens to the liquid waste? That's the question. Uh, BSL one can directly go into the standard sewer system uh, without any treatment because the organisms are generally safe. In case of BSL two, uh, based on the risk assessment, if there is a huge potential, um, then you should decontaminate it ideally. So as I said, the guideline does not demand it, but based on risk assessment. Uh, ideally, any waste going out of BSL-2 should also get decontaminated, uh, either by autoclaving it if it's possible, or at least chemically de deactivating it. All right. Um, the next question is from Narsini Raju. What is the relation between OEP levels and BSL levels? OE and BSL are two different subjects. OE is uh, occupational exposure. And uh, we do not uh, uh, counter or bring in the OE aspect into the BSL part simply because uh, OE are well defined only for chemical entities and not for biological entities. For biological entities, it is only the uh, uh, assessment in terms of the potential for it to cause a harm. And you cannot apply OE to a biosafety laboratory. Okay, um, we can take a few more questions. Um, the next one is from Ravi Ram. Uh, he asks, should the facility itself have HEPA filtered air supply? Uh, for a BSL-3 and BSL-4, it is, uh, yes, good to have. Uh, it is uh, It should have HEPA filtered air supply because you are then uh, preventing the uh, sample from getting contaminated or the people getting contaminated from the general flora which is present in the air. You see the air which is going to get sucked into through an air chew is also going to be contaminated with the species which is around, uh, around us. And we do not know the synergy of two organisms going in. So for a BSL-3 and 4, it is good to have a HEPA filtered air inflow. Uh, in case of BSL-1 uh, and 2, it is not necessary. All right. Um, Vartika Verma ask, is there any other way to discard or dispose microbes from BSL-1 apart from autoclaves? Uh, generally, uh, yes, you could discard it by a chemical decontamination because a lot of these microorganisms get deactivated with a simple treatment like uh, sodium hypochlorite uh, decontamination. So chemical decontamination is a known means of uh, decontamination. Uh, there is a protocol to be followed for decontamination where you collect all the uh, waste in one bin, you decontaminate it. There has to be a certain residence time or a, a time which is supposed to be given with the decontamination agent before it can go out. A lot of times people uh, take a shortcut, they collect the waste, they just dump the hypochlorite uh, solution and then they just dispose it off. Uh, it's not going to get decontaminated because there needs to be a certain interaction time between the hypochlorite and the microorganism to get it deactivated. Because you are oxidizing, or hypochlorite is an oxidizing agent, it has to deactivate, and for oxidizing, it needs some time. This is an interesting question from Aditi Sarbajna. And the question is, what biosafety measures should college laboratories undertake? Uh, college laboratories generally do not deal with uh, uh, dangerous organisms. They normally would work with uh, general, uh, regarded safe microorganisms. So biosafety level one is good enough. It's good to have a biosafety cabinet installed in the lab and have procedural controls uh, with a certain limited access, even in the college premises. The reason is very clear that when students are uh, working with microorganisms, they are not uh, necessarily trained. They are getting trained on uh, microorganisms and the microbiological practices. So a certain procedural control would always help. But it's not necessary because no colleges 
I would deal with a BSL-3-4 level of microorganisms for sure. And BSL-2 also, if we are dealing with, then it is only at a very high end research level where uh, students with PhD and those kind of researches go on with BSL-2 organisms. Wonderful. The next one is from Anshul Kumar. He asks, how to decontaminate biosafety cabinet before starting the work and for how much time should we switch on the UV light? Okay, so UV light, um, unfortunately, is not the best way to decontaminate a biosafety cabinet. I'm sorry to uh, break hearts of a lot of people who think that UV light is good. UV lights are only mutating in nature, okay? UV light uh, is used as a means of decontamination uh, when people buy equipment, but that's not the ideal way of decontamination. The ideal way of decontamination would be to use a sporicidal agent, uh, anti uh, sporicidal agent, uh, which is sprayed within the area or can be, if it can be recirculated through the air system, that's the ideal way of decontaminating a biosafety lab. The duration of this uh, decontamination would uh, have to follow a procedure where uh, bio. Uh, biomarkers have to be kept at different locations inside the, um, uh, inside the biosafety cabinet and the effectiveness of the biosporidical uh, bio agent has to be uh, checked out. Uh, when you are changing organisms, it is sometimes good to change the HEPA filters. Uh, surface decontamination using the biodecontamination agents is uh, uh, the, uh, the second way of doing it. And there are nowadays a lot of these decontamination agents, not because of COVID-19, but even otherwise that are available in the market, which can be used to wipe the surfaces clean. So either use wipes uh, with a decontaminating agent, or if you uh, can do it, uh, do a vapor uh, phase oxidizing agent, uh, which circulates into the air space and can decontaminate not only the workspace, but also the plenum, which is around it. So um, we've got time for two more questions and I'm going to go with the viewer's choice. Uh, there are a few which are garnering quite a bit of thumbs up. Mm -hmm. First one is from Thai Gwen and uh, he asks, what is the difference between using stone and phenolic for laboratory worktop in terms of biosafety? Okay, um, when choosing a biosafety uh, worktop, what is to be, uh, what is important is to use a work surface which is not porous. Uh, the reason is that when you have a porous surface at a microscopic level, those are areas where your microorganisms will grow very easily. So ideally you should use a known porous surface which is well polished and without uh, uh, fissures and breaks. Uh, I would go with a phenolic surface because Phenolic surface can be rendered much more smoother and free of uh, those crevices as compared to a stone surface. Um, ideally, if you ask me, I prefer stainless steel in microbiology laboratories because they can be easily decontaminated and they can be polished to a very fine surface finish so that it does not have crevices. But if you are asking me a choice between stone and phenolic, phenolic, uh, uh, laminated phenolics are much better. All right, for the final question from Raviram, do I need an institutional biosafety committee set up when starting a BSN one lab for R&D in India? If so, what's the procedure? Please elaborate. Um, there are certain laws which require uh, you to declare when you are dealing in bio, uh, in bio organisms, when you're dealing with organisms. Uh, I do not think it is necessary for a BSL-1 facility, but when it comes to BSL-2 and above, yes, it is necessary. Institutional biosafety committees uh, do have to get formed even for BSL-1 uh, because of the simple fact that the law asks for it. So you need to declare it, but uh, there is a, slight liberty given in terms of the report submission and uh, how often you need to go back to the biosafety committee to have a review done. Yeah. 
Let me. All right. So there's a related question. I thought. Sorry, um, uh, sorry uh, yeah. Vijay. I will pull out some more data on this and share it on the website uh, because I need to uh, check specific laws in India. So let me check that and give a more, uh, I would say, specific answer to this question. Okay, that's wonderful. So uh, well, that's pretty much uh, the time we have for today. Um, and I think you've ignited <laughs> a lot of minds here. There are so many unanswered questions. Hey, but guys, uh, not to worry. We will pick up each and every question and uh, Viresh will respond to it. And all the responses will be published on our website, which is www.kivani.in. Um, you know, a copy of the presentation that Viresh used, the recording of this webinar, along with the uh, unanswered uh, questions will be put up on the website. So just follow us on our social media channels and you will get to know when we are publishing it. With that, um, thank you very much again for making time to join us today. I hope um, you had a wonderful session. We'll see you the next time. So stay safe and stay curious. This thank is you. Perspectives, a thought leader initiative by Kivani. Thank you and good evening. Thank you and good evening.